Our covenant service reading is from Acts 19, verses 1 to 20. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptised? They answered, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptised with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about twelve of them. He entered the synagogue and for three months spoke out boldly and argued persuasively about the kingdom of God. When some stubbornly refused to believe and spoke evil of the way before the congregation, he left them, taking the disciples with him, and argued daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that when the handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some itinerant Jewish exorcists tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit said to them in reply, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered them all and so overpowered them that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. When this became known to all residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, everyone was awestruck and the name of the Lord Jesus was praised. Also many of those who became believers confessed and disclosed their practices. A number of those who practiced magic collected their books and burned them publicly. When the value of these books was calculated, it was found to come to 50,000 silver coins. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Amen. Brill, thank you, Guy. If you can whack that PowerPoint up, please, Chris, that'd be brilliant. You'll have to click for me because I didn't bring, I, didn't, I forgot the clicker. So anyway, bro, ever heard that phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? The person who wrote this obviously um, knows more than the person who coined that phrase. Because it's not true, is it? Sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but words will never hurt me. Words will... Words have huge power. Words can hurt us. People can say things that are sharp. People can say things that they don't even think they're saying that are particularly mean, but they can say them and they'll cut right to the heart. Um, words have great power. Words affect things. So, for example, when I became a citizen of the UK, what had to happen was I had to go and do a ceremony in the town hall in Trowbridge and, or County Hall in Trowbridge, and I had to say with a bunch of other people who were um, doing this, uh, becoming citizens as well, we had to say the, the oath together. We had to declare it out loud in the presence of officials because wasn't, I wasn't a citizen until I'd actually said it out loud. Isn't that interesting? You're not, and it's the same with marriage. It's the same with anything else like that. You, uh, anything kind of legal, it has to be said out loud for it to affect. Words have power. If it's true of our words that words have power, how much truer then is it of God's words? God's words have immense power. You read it right at the beginning. God said, let there be light, and there was light. 
Amen? So God's words have power. And so that's kind of what I'm going to... If we go to the next slide, please, Chris. Um, you can't really see this very well. But that's Paul. That's a sort of icon of Paul. It's not very good. Um, but he's gone to Ephesus. Now, it says he went to Ephesus via the interior regions. What it means is, because he was in Corinth, and then what it means is he walked or he traveled inland, not by sea, to get to Ephesus. Because from Corinth, he could have just gone straight there but uh, by sea, but he didn't. He walked around. So he went to Ephesus, and he preached the word of the Lord. And at the end of the passage, Luke tells us that the word of the Lord grew mightily. It, what does it say? It says that um, the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Um, you see, the passage had the, the passage, the, the Word of God had full effect on the people um, who were there, and they all made a response. So you had the first people who were baptized into John's baptism. They made a response when they heard about Jesus, whom John was pointing to, and they received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues and um, were um, prophesying as a result. They made a response. Then you have the Jews that Paul was talking to in Ephesus, and the Jews, as usual, were stubborn and refused to believe. That was their response, and they even spoke ill of Christians. Uh, then you had these itinerant exorcists. Make no mistake, if you smiled when you read this story, that's what you're supposed to do. It's funny, because the the, the exorcists who were going to drive out the demons ended up being driven out by the demons. Isn't that hilarious? It, it's, it's funny because it's, cause they, cause he says, Jesus, I know, and the, the Greek actually points to Paul, I respect, but who are you? <laughs> and then the demon overpowered them and drove them out of the house. Now, that's hilarious. Um, the, the serious point that Luke is making there, though, is that what happened is that Paul was known by God. Paul knew God, and Paul was known by God. And the demons know Jesus, and they, they know who he is and what he stands for and his power and his authority. But when we're not in Christ, when we're not known by God, we have no power over the demons. We can't tell them what to do. And that was the case with these itinerant exorcists. That was their kind of response. They tried to use the name of Jesus, the Word, as a charm to try and drive out demons. Well, that's not right. That's not, that's not a good response. But then we see that many other people heard the Word and they made a response and their lives were transformed. As we see, as we see later on um, in verse 19, um, lots of people... Um, Lots of people burn their books and all the rest of it. So today, people need to hear the Word. People need to hear the Word of the Lord. And here's the shocker, and I've never said this before, but we need to be the ones telling them. You can laugh because I've said that many times before. We need to be the ones who tell them the Word of the Lord. But before we do that, before we do that, we have to be the ones to make a response to the Word. The Word has to make a difference in our lives. And so the invitation for us this morning is to hear the Word of the Lord and to make a response to it. To hear the, make, hear the Word of the Lord and make a response to it. And the reason why I think this is so important for us is, as we said, that words have power to transform. God's words have power to transform a locality, a town, a place, a church, a person's life. They literally do. Um, and we see the effect that it had on Ephesus. As if you read the rest of Acts 19, and I do encourage you to go and read the rest of the chapter, you will see from verse 21 till the end of the chapter, some local silversmiths were really unhappy about the effect that the word of the Lord was having on Ephesus, so much so that people weren't going to the temple to worship the many-breasted god of Artemis, the goddess Artemis. She had, she was a bit, and so what those silversmiths would do is they'd make these little um, icons, if you like, little statuettes of the of the goddess, and people would pay money for them, and and they would make their trade by making these things. So people, as they would come to the temple, would buy these things. You'd have people that lived there. You'd have tourists and and, and other people who'd flock because they worshipped Artemis wherever they were, and they were coming to the temple. And so what happened was, people were getting saved, and. Artemis wasn't being worshipped anymore, and the silversmiths were getting ticked off because they weren't making any money. 
And so they'd wanted to drag Paul into the, um, into the, the, the town square, as it were, and start beating him because drive him out because he wasn't, the people were becoming Christians. They weren't happy about it. That is the power of God's Word. It can change even the local economy. It can change the whole world economy if we let it. That's the power of God's Word. So, if we long to see Westbury and indeed this nation and the nations transformed in, in, in something like that, um, we've, got to, we've got to make a response to God's Word and tell people about it. My prayer is that every church, every town, every village, every city, every country will be impacted so much by the Word of God that things will look different because that is the call of the church to bring the culture of heaven to earth. That's what Jesus did when He came and that's, what, that's the mission, mission that He gave us to bring the culture of heaven to earth. So next slide, how? How on earth can we respond to the Word in such a way that makes a difference to us and to the world around us. Because at the end of the day, I'm only one bloke. I've only got influence over so many people. I can't do that much. But if you think about the church worldwide, everybody's got lots of people they're in touch with. Think about the transformation that can happen if you just start talking about the Word and it makes such a difference. How can we respond? So I want to talk about three ways to respond. And the first one is this. Turn from ignorance to knowledge. You don't have to read all the words on there. I just wanted to put verses 1 to 7 up on there for you. Some of the disciples, as we said right at the beginning, they didn't know about Jesus. They only knew about John's baptism. John's baptism was a baptism for repentance, um, kind of turning around and preparing for the way of the Lord, preparing the way for Jesus. So when Paul says, into what baptism, because baptism was a common practice, lots of people did that. And he said, well, we, have, we don't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Can you imagine going to a Christian church now and saying, well, there isn't a Holy Spirit? In fact, it wasn't so long ago that that was, that was the Trinity, was it not? Father, Son, and Holy Book, there was no Spirit. Spirit didn't do things. You weren't allowed to have the Spirit. We weren't allowed to have charismatic things. We weren't allowed to speak in tongues because that wasn't, that God doesn't do that. That's not true. And so this, this, they, they were like that, ignorant, didn't know what was going on. Excuse me. So Paul spoke about Jesus. He told them who Jesus was. He told them um, that that's who John came to prepare the way for. And, they were this, and then they became into knowledge. And that's the response we need to make. Turning from ignorance to knowledge means we have to educate ourselves. Here's, if we go to the next slide, you can see a little picture of a travel agency. I read this story. A brisk la little lady inquired at a travel agent about a certain European tour. The agent mentioned that this particular tour included the Passion Play at Oberammergau. Now, if you've ever known that, if you know where this is, important big play they do it every 10 years. The woman drew herself up to her full five feet one and replied icily, I'm sick and tired of all this sex stuff, and I'm surprised at you. And then she stormed out. If we go to the next slide... That's what the passion play is. It's about Jesus, but she misinterpreted. She was ignorant. She didn't know what the, passion, pa what the passion play was about. She thought it was to do with sex or something like that. We, sad to say, can be just the same when it comes to God's Word. What's important, though, is that we don't stay that way. Paul says to Timothy, who stays in Ephesus eventually as the pastor of the church, the next slide, he says in the old AV, study to show thyself, or in, the, in the, a more modern translation, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by Him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. Study to show thyself. I mean, it's not quite what the, what the Greek says, but it's do yourself, do the best you can to know what the Word says. Get it in your head. Um, if you see, go to the next slide. If we want the place to be transformed by the Word of God, we can't live 
in ignorance. But it has to do three things. It's got to affect our head. We've got to get it in our heads. We've got to learn it in our heads cognitively. But it can't just stay in our heads because that is a very Greek understanding of the world. If we think that it's just going to happen because we know it, you can educate people. This is where the the left wing goes a little bit wrong, I'm afraid. They think that education, 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 education is going to change people's behavior. Has it ever done that? No. You can know something until you're blue in the face, but you will never change your behavior unless what you know begins to affect what you do. And you have to make a decision to do that. So we need to learn it, we need to live it, do it, and we need to have, be captivated in our hearts. Our hearts need to be impassioned with the Word of God. And I'm not talking about some weird Jesus freak like it happened in the 70s with, with the Jesus movement. What I'm talking about is just everyday normal people, but our hearts are captivated by Jesus. That's what we need. That's what we need. And that should be our response, is that we learn it, we do it, and we're impassioned by it. We don't do it just because we've heard that it's a good idea. We do it because our hearts have been captivated by Jesus. Nobody ever wants to go and give their money away, or nobody ever wants to go and buy food for the food bank just because they think it's a nice thing to do. Now, some people do, and some Christians do that. They do all kinds of social action, and then you ask them why they're doing it, and they have no idea because it's not really in their heads. They don't know what's the point. So we've got to know it, we've got to be impassioned by it, and we've got to do it. Turn from ignorance to knowledge. So that's the first way to respond. Second way is hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. In verse 10, we see um, Paul says it continued for two years. So Paul was probably in Ephesus for about three years, all told. Um, He continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Everybody heard the word of the Lord. It's probably a bit of hyperbole. and I'm not sure if everybody in the whole of Asia heard the word of the Lord, but lots of people did. And Paul says in Romans 10 there, that second verse, faith comes from what is heard. Or as the old AV says, faith comes by hearing. And what is hearing comes through the word of Christ. What's heard is the word of Christ. If it's going to make a difference in our lives, we've got to hear it to begin with. So if we go to the next slide, a hardened unbeliever, this is, um, went to hear, but not to, not, not to hear, but to see George Whitfield. So he, as a hardened unbeliever went to see him, but not to hear him. Uh, when he preached uh, outdoors to a great throng, probably not too dissimilar to this crowd here. So, because he wanted to see him, he climbs up a tree and he puts his fingers in his ears. So he can't hear what George Whitfield is saying. Then a persistent fly lit on his nose. He shook his head. The fly wouldn't go anywhere. And so what did he have to do? Just as he removed a hand from his ear to flick the fly away, Whitfield quoted the verse, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And then he spoke of the willful refusal of many to hear the Spirit's voice. The unbeliever was so impressed by what had happened that he opened not only his ears to the gospel, but also his heart. We've got to hear the word of the Lord. And what am I talking about? It sounds simple, but we can be just like those Jews earlier in the chapter where they stubbornly refused to listen to what Paul was saying. And we can be just as pharisaical as the Pharisees and say, I'm not going to hear what God wants to tell me. And so we can come to church week after week after week. We can hear the Bible being read. We can hear it being preached. But it goes over, it goes in one ear and out the other, and it makes absolutely no difference to our lives. Like we said before, it's got to go in here and down to this. It's got to make the 12-inch journey from our head to our heart and make a difference. Because when we hear the word of the Lord, it has power to save 
to heal, to guide, to do the miraculous, and any number of things. If we go to the next slide, we see that Isaiah said this, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and don't return there until they've watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in for the thing for which I sent it. God says, my word is not empty. So even if you have sat in church services for years and decades and it's gone in one ear and out the other, it hasn't actually gone in one ear and out the other. It's gone in one ear and down to your heart. The issue is, what have you done to respond to it? Because God's because if you don't do something with it, God's going God's to make sure. I heard this thing said um, when we were at Fresh Dreams, which I vehemently disagree with. God is like a perfect gentleman. I want to say right now, God is most definitely not a perfect gentleman because he is not English. How many of you think God is a nice English man who does nice things for you? That's not who God is. Get that idea straight out of your head. He is not English, and he is not a gentleman. If God wants to do something with you, my friends, he will flipping well do it, without doubt. I mean, I remember saying the same thing to Guy Chevreau. Guy Chevreau was a Baptist pastor in the Toronto area um, when the Toronto blessing was kicking off. He went to Toronto saw what was happening, couldn't believe his eyes and ears, and just realized God was in the place and couldn't. And eventually he wrote a book called Catching the Fire, which charted the history of the whole thing and what was going on. And everybody, they thought, he, the guy was, was brilliant. But he himself, he's, he's, he's a very gentle, unassuming kind of guy, actually. But he, I had the opportunity to pray with him once. And he said, he, it, was, it was to do with um, something. I didn't go up for prayer once, and he, I kind of wanted to do a repentance. And he said, he said, well, you know, um, and I said, well, because God's a gentleman. And he said, uh, well, you know, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> I was like, oh, really? <laughs> and sure enough, if you look, you'll never see anywhere that it says that God's a gentleman. He's not a gentleman. He said, when you see the Holy Spirit pick somebody up and throw them across the room, you know he's not a gentleman. Also, the Bible talks about the Spirit as the wind of God. In, in the Hebrew, it's ruach. In the, in the Greek, it's pneuma, or pneuma, if you want to put the P on. And both can be translated wind or spirit. Now, how many of you know we've got a storm going to brew in right now? When that wind, that wind most definitely imposes itself on you. Friends, the Lord will impose himself on you at one stage or another. The difference is, what are you going to do when he does that? What am I going to do when he imposes himself on me? Is he going to make me, am I, am I going to do what he wants me to do? So we've got to hear the word and be transformed. We can't just think that it's, we've got to make a response to it. So when we hear it and he imposes himself on us, what are we going to do? None of that was in the script, by the way. Next slide, final thing that we, to respond, adopt new practices. Adopt new practices. Verses 18 to 19 Many of those who became believers confessed and disclosed their practices. A number of those who practiced magic collected their books and burned them publicly. When the value of these books was calculated, it was found to, to come to 50,000 silver coins. One silver coin was a day's wage. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. And Ephesus was this place. They were obsessed with magic. And they were like, yeah, we love magic and the occult and all these hidden things. And it was like they burnt their spell books. Well, because once, once, you, once you showed somebody a spell, it lost its power. So that's why it had to be hidden. They changed their practices. They confessed their old practices and they changed their ways. Their lives were transformed and they took up new practices. And that has to be the same for us. Now, it's going to be different for every single person. You're not going to respond in, in, in quite the same way. For some people, when they hear the word of the Lord and they're transformed, their life is changed in an instant. They are totally different. Now, that's amazing, and I love those kind of testimonies. They're the best. Talk to Mike if you want to know any more about an instant transformation, because that was what happened to him. So that's some people, that happens. Quite a few people, that happens. But for others of us, for me especially, 
because I'm like the Jews, I'm a stubborn hard heart. I'm most definitely like the Jews in many ways. It takes us a bit longer to get the point. And God has to work with us. We're like, have you ever had a piece of clay? Anybody ever used clay in some artwork years ago, maybe? Clay, when it's cold, is like a rock. It's so hard. We can be just like that clay when it comes to changing our ways. So for some of us, it takes a bit of time to change. Now, for some people, the issue, the old practice, is something like alcoholism. That's hard. For somebody to come off the drink and stop refusing the drink and not be around the drink, knowing that a lot of their friends probably drink as well, that's hard work to get off that. And it takes time for somebody to wean themselves off. Same for things like drugs. We've all, you know, it takes time for some of these things. For others of us, we're addicted to our gadgets. I'm, I've got one on my wrist, I've got one in my pocket, and I'm reading this sermon off one of these. And at home, I have computers everywhere. I remember once I counted I had five computers in the house. That was in the days when one computer in a household was unusual. Now there's bajillions in there. There's a load in the vestry. Maybe I need to change my ways and stop using technology quite so much or relying on it or being obsessed about it. I don't know. So some of us take time. We're like that lump of clay that just needs to take some time to be heated up, warmed by the Word of the Lord. For some people, it just takes small steps just to get there every day, one step towards Jesus every day. Wherever you are on that, the point is we've got to change head, heart, and hands. It's got to make a difference to the way we actually do things. Why is this important? The thing is, if we persist in our old ways, what happens is it actually means, it sh what, it, what it actually shows to people in the world is that my faith means nothing. If my life is not changed by the Word, then it means absolutely nothing to the rest of the world. And that's no good. Nobody wants to be in that way. Faith's got to make a difference to us. If it doesn't make a difference to us, what on earth is the point in having it? It's got to change our lives. Shedding our old ways and embracing the new ways of the kingdom. Back to the, the next slide, back to the head, hands, and heart. It's got to affect all three areas of our life. It's got to do something in our head. We've got to learn it. Then it's got to change our hearts, and then we've got to do it. Some people, it's the other way around. You've got to do it, and it changes your heart as you do it. Either way, it's got to make a difference. We've got to change our practices from the old to the new. Excuse me. So, last slide. Back to this. Words are powerful. Words have an impact. When we hear the Word of God, we've got to make a response because people will see our lives and the church. And when we make a response that says yes to God, when we hear the Word, when we learn it, when we go from ignorance to knowledge, when we go and change our, our practices, people will see the difference that the Word of God makes in our lives. And that is the best response that we can make to God's Word. So let's take a moment and just allow some of that to settle in our hearts and say, Lord, Holy Spirit, what's the one thing that I need to do? What's the one thing I need to hear and do as a result of this? What's Jesus saying to me and what am I going to do about it? Just take a moment. Thank you, Lord. Just let it settle. Thank you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. More of you, Jesus. Come and rest on our minds, in our hearts, on our hands. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, God. Bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. How great is the love of God for us. He shed his love abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Father God, we bless you and we thank you for your word which has power. Thank you that when it goes forth, when you send it, it will achieve the purpose for which you've sent it. It will do what you've called it to do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that your word even today has come to us. We pray, our God, that we would hear what you're saying to us and that we would have the willingness to respond and do something about it even if it is simply to go home and pray about it. That is a perfectly valid response. We thank you, Lord, that you give us the opportunity to respond. We thank you, Lord, that you are patient with us and that it doesn't matter how long it takes as long as we're getting there. And so, Word of God, be planted in our hearts today, we pray. Lord, where we are not impassioned by your word, where it makes no difference and our hearts are hard and stubborn like that clay, like the Jews who just refuse to listen. Lord, come. Come with the fire of God and melt those hearts of ours so that as we hear your word, we are impassioned by your word to love Jesus even greater than we we did before. Lord, where we are ignorant, where we just don't read the Word and we don't know what you say, where we don't listen to prophetic words, don't listen, don't, aren't, aren't bothered by any of that, Lord, may we turn from our ignorance to knowledge. As we read the pages of Scripture, not just on a Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, may the Word impact our lives afresh so that we go from ignorance to knowledge. And finally, Lord, may we change the way we work. May our hands be fit and equipped to do all that you've called us to to do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we don't do this in our own strength, but you've given us your Spirit. So come now, Holy Spirit, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Come and move afresh in our hearts, in our minds, and in our hands. Maybe we even feel a tingling in our hands right now. What's the Lord calling us to do? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. We bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, God. And you know, as as you said before, God is faithful. If he sent his word,